Best on Diddly Simpsons Podcast, Best on Diddly Simpsons Podcast, Best on Diddly Simpsons Podcast. But this Two guys talking about turtles? Movie power. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I threw you off. Yeah, it's cool. No, hey, welcome back to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. This is usually a weekly podcast about The Simpsons for anyone who loves The Simpsons or ever has loved The Simpsons, hosted by two dudes that grew up on The Simpsons. But we also happen to be two dudes that grew up on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And today, we're declaring it Turtles Day. Well, yesterday, really, because it's the 30th anniversary of the 1990 film hitting theaters. And we decided we'd like to talk about that this week instead. So welcome to, I guess, a throwback episode, or we're bringing back movies on the half shell, and oh, your co-host, you as the most, as always, Richie the Whiz Kid is joining me today. Welcome back to Movies on the Half Shell, Rich. Blast from the past, bro. I don't even think I still have that program that I used to create movie posters <laughs> for us. I thought that was like but, uh, MS Paint or whatever. I don't, I don't <laughs> know. It probably was. <laughs> I guess we could tie these two items we're reviewing together by saying they both use the word cowabunga and they both took place in the 90s when they were at their prime, maybe. Like, I'm trying to segue us from Simpsons into Turtles. That's perfect. But, yeah, you're welcome, people out there. But yeah, I guess we have a bit to talk about today. I know you're really excited about this. I'll leave intrigue behind my excitement slash maybe not excitement. We'll see. I don't know. I'm going to throw it back to you so I can quit rambling. The man, the myth, the hose brain. It is Miles. All right, first question. I know I that you uh, just watched this movie because I asked you to watch this movie, but I also watched this movie yesterday. What I want to <laughs> know is what's the last time you watched this movie before yesterday or today or whenever you watched it? I actually was thinking about that very heavily, and there was one time that came into mind, but I really... Don't know if we should get all into that <laughs> on this podcast. Was I on actually... drugs? No, oh. uh, probably. Oh. Um, <laughs> I was like, why don't you want to talk about it? <laughs> I think it's when we lived together. Oh, in, wow. In the apartment, maybe. I, I find it hard to believe that I haven't seen it since then, but somebody came over at a very early hour in the day, and while you and I were watching the first one, and we ended up watching all three of them. Oh, right on. And somebody took me out to Taco Cabana during, at like three in the morning to go get tacos. It wasn't you. I, so, I can I, think of one person that that might be. I don't, you, you can say it if you want to. But yeah, um, uh, that's crazy talk, sir. Because like I for <laughs> sure watched this movie at least once in 2019. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I, like, I watch this movie all the time. It's legitimately my favorite comic book movie of all time. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess we should get right into it then, man. Like there's a... Uh... Uh, can I just say, first of all, I'm, I'm kind of jumping the gun here. I feel like the action holds up over these years. Like, these turtles can do some really good martial arts. Dude, the action, the acting, like, the voice actors, the puppeteering. Uh, Love the puppet. Oh, my, all of it, man. The music, man. The music hits <laughs> so hard, dude. Like, I'm not talking about, like, the, the rap at the end, which is dope, the T-U-R-T-L-E power. But, like, I'm talking about, like, the, just, like, the score of the film, I feel, is really powerful. I love the way it, like, you know, changes, uh, just, like, it's, like, got the classic villain theme when, when Shudder comes out, so everything gets really dark and ominous. Uh, it's got the uplifting, like, family, and, like, even when they're out at the, like, woods, and they're, like, kind of, like, getting their spirit back and trying to, like, reconnect with Splinter, like, getting I love those moments. Man, like... I, those are things that I look back and I'm like, how in the fuck did this movie keep me captivated as a kid? But like, at the same time, like, I, I love this movie just as much now, but I, or as I did as a kid. And like, I was obsessed with the Ninja Turtles when I was a kid. Oh, absolutely. I, I was right there with you, man. But something that happens early on in the movie that I have to say, I completely forgot just because it's been so long. And if you needed, if you were on the fence on whether or not this is a good movie, all I have to say is, any movie with Sam Rockwell is a good movie, yes, and I completely dude. forgot he was in this movie. So when I saw young Sam Rockwell, I was like, holy crap, <laughs> yes, okay, I'm sold. And he's been in the movie for like two seconds, the he's first 10 really minutes. He's really good. He, he's uh, got a very small role, but he immediately shows a lot of just charisma on screen whenever you see him. 
Yeah, it's got to love us some Sam. A little uh, Ephesus for Family tie-in for you as well there. Hell yeah. Dude, uh, you know, one of my favorite scenes with him, it's really subtle, but uh, it's when Tenzu is fighting, like, one of the other thugs, and it's towards the end of the, the movie or whatever. Uh, it, or, I'm sorry, I think it's actually when he's fighting Casey Jones. And yeah. like, Sam, you can kind of see Sam Rockwell's character has, like, that kind of, like, epiphany of, like, you know, wait, what are what are we doing? And, like, he, he it's probably, what, like a second and a half where like it's just an expression that he makes but like you can tell that dude's got acting shops even back then (laughs) and come on casey jones man dude casey jones is incredible in this movie he really does i I love the look and the actor uh i'm trying it's like elias um elias codius i always forget how to say yeah something like that but he's like one of those like character actor dudes that you just see pop up in like everything but like Never did he, like, rock the character as well, in my mind, like, where he just, like, was the character. But, like, part of it's the hockey mask and the look, I get that. But, like, Casey Jones, I'm so glad that they chose to to bring that story and that character uh, to life in this film. Which kind of ties in just to the, the idea of this movie, which is commonly talked about. This movie is considerably darker than most... Oh, yeah. most uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, Turtle. like properties like n- recently they actually came out with Batman versus the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles which is a very dark but animated film um but this was a a really different time man like this was right after Batman had came out and like movie comic book movies in particular were were really changing one of my favorite facts about this one is that uh, it's actually at the time the highest grossing independent film ever. It made 135 million off of a, uh, or that's 135 domestic and 66 foreign, and that actually held all the way until 1999. Uh, do you want to take a guess at what movie dethroned it? Uh, 1999 was that? Oh, you said independent movie. Yeah, independent is the key word there. It's got to be an independent film. Oh, I have no idea. You're going to kick yourself when you hear the answer. Braveheart. I don't know. Braveheart was like 95. Uh, uh, and also, <laughs> I think, a major studio production. I don't know. <laughs> if I it has, Mel as a, yeah, as a yeah, rule, yeah. if it has Mel Gibson in it, it's a studio project. A studio I'm pretty film. sure. Well, not anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, well, back, maybe, in, yeah. back in the 90s. And he's probably come around again. I don't really follow him. But uh, regardless Diet of Diet Coke, the movie. It was actually the Blair, Rich, uh, Blair Witch Project. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't have guessed that one. See, I would have I would have thought that like you would have been like, oh, yeah, super low budget, makes a ton of money. Seems kind of obvious in hindsight to me. Miles, 1999 was a long time ago at this point. 21 years, man. Yeah, yeah, very long time ago. Yeah, 1999 can drink, bro. Legally. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> crazy. But yeah, that's uh, that's kind of cool, I think. Like, first of all, that it's kind of crazy to think that in 1990 that Ninja Turtles was done as an independent film because, like, the studios didn't, didn't, didn't see it as, like, the live-action potential, I guess. Yeah, well, and definitely, like, getting back to what you brought up, the darkness of it. Like, I re- I think, I don't remember if I actually saw this one in theaters, because I would have been, we would have been five at the time, so I don't think I saw it in theaters. Did not, I, I saw def- the second one in theaters, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But I'm pretty sure my dad probably brought it home, and then we all watched it at home. But I remember, like, I felt a little weird at first with the movie because like I was used to the cartoon show and like how happy go lucky it is. And and like Raphael's first line is basically like right out the gate. Damn. Yeah. And he's, they throw a lot of dams out in this movie. Dude, dams, the dams fly in this iteration of the turtles for sure. Yeah. And it's not just rap that's doing it either. Like they all do it for the most part, but yeah, it definitely had a dark feel. I mean, Raph is almost dead and they never give him any medical attention. Like it just happens in this movie. So actually that's another thing too. I mentioned Tensu earlier. He's like uh shredders right hand man in this film. There's actually a scene where he fights one of the pupils and he like takes a cheap shot on him, uh, trying yeah. to like, teach him a lesson. Well, in the original script, uh, he actually killed that student or what that member of the foot clan. And in uh, the American version, and I think basically all but one country, I'm trying to remember, it may have been, but there's one specific country where the guy dies, but in every other country, they added in post a sound of him taking a like, <gasps> like breath to like make sure that it was very clear that he was just knocked out, not like killed huh. or whatever. But like that goes just to like the darkness, like we were talking about. And 
a lot of that was because of the fact that this uh, movie was able to kind of fly under the radar as an independent film. But what's really interesting uh, is the changes that occurred from the first to the second. Uh, oh, I also want to say that I do remember I was a uh, I, I lived in Phoenix at the time, Phoenix, Arizona, and my my like memory of this movie is I never actually owned this movie as a kid on VHS. I had it copied where it played on Shotgun Saturday Afternoons, which was <laughs> like a thing they did every Saturday in Phoenix, and like so I had the copy tape. Where you do the thing where when the commercials would start, you would like pause. And then when the commercials would end, you'd like play again or record again. So I've got like the very beginning and very end of like, you know, some really shitty commercials periodic. And I think periodically. And I remember there was at one point in the movie where I guess like my parents had just forgotten. To, like my parents would have been the ones doing this at this time for me, recording it or whatever. Uh, and I guess they just like forgot to like skip the commercials because there's like one random like commercial break in the middle of this vhs tape. <laughs> but yeah anyway uh the the darkness factor is real gets real interesting because it was actually jim henson that did the puppets for this movie and he was actually very outspoken that he was not happy with this film because he did not like his basically work being tied to something so violent he considered it to be and that had some uh, to do with the tone of the film changing significantly going into the uh, second movie. But of course, the primary factor on that was once the studio did get involved, because the second one, I want to say, was produced by New Line Cinema, if I remember correctly. That sounds and right. I remember seeing the... I watched the trailer so many times as a kid. I See, I had that VHS, like, and it's like yeah. actual, like, my parents had to pay for it format. So, like, yeah. I definitely saw the the you know cinema or new line cinema pop up a lot uh but e either way it was definitely a studio and like their number one priority at this point is of course to sell toys of course that uh, makes sense that's actually the entire reason uh what are the uh characters um razar and um Toka, Toka, that was the name of my box Razor, yeah, yeah. Back in the day when I uh, was a kid those characters were actually invented for the second movie just so they could put them into the toy line I remember when that one came out, I was like, not Bebop and Rocksteady? Right? Yeah, that's what everybody said. It's like, where the hell are Bebop and Rocksteady? But they were already selling enough Bebop and, Rock Bebop and Rocksteady toys from the uh, cartoon show, I guess. And they wanted to spin some records with Vanilla Ice in that second one. Go, Ninja, go, Ninja, go. <laughs> so I saw an interesting fact about this movie on IMDb that like tied it into Robin Williams. Did you see that? Yeah. Yes, dude, that's incredible, actually. Go ahead, tell everybody. Yeah, apparently Robin Williams was a huge fan of the franchise, and he was filming a movie, Cadillac Man, with Judith, who played April, and like he let her use his comic book collection so that she could get more information about April. And it seems like there's a lot of, like, I always knew there was some turmoil, maybe, with, with April in the first movie. Like, I really liked her portrayal of April, but like I always remembered as a kid seeing different people playing her and it always kind of threw me off but like i heard the jumpsuit was a disaster because they're trying to make her yeah look she like apparently the... was not into that at all i heard that as well yeah and then something about like the violence made her not want to reprise it in the second movie or something like it just it seems like there's a whole lot of stuff that went on with april which is a big deal because she's like basically the main character of the movie She's the main human character for sure, yeah. especially moving on throughout the uh, the sequels and whatnot. And I heard a lot of that. Uh, I don't think that she was actually ever offered the second movie, though, because uh, she complained so much on, in the first movie, which is sad because, to be completely honest, I think that uh, she was a better April O'Neil than the woman that took her over. I'm trying to remember what her name is. I'm looking it up right now. Uh, is it the Paige, same one in the second and third one? Yeah, the second and third one, she's played by Paige Turco, uh, who did a good job, and I, I I wasn't disappointed with her portrayal in the movie by any means, but I thought that Judith Hogue actually played a better April. I think to some extent she had a little bit more of like a ruggedness about her, and like a, like she's like a gritty New York reporter, and like in the sequels, Paige Turco, who took over, she just seems too like, not nice, I guess. I don't know. Like, she doesn't seem like she would be like able to cut it in like New York. You know what I mean? I mean, she only has to cut it in the sewers, though. That's fair. And really, she but just I'm has to cut enough pizza to in keep ancient the Japan. Happy. Yeah. High foot. 
<laughs> Who are you expecting? Maybe the uh, Adams family. <laughs> I always remember that from the third one. But I we're always here remember to talk the, the, the dance, one. like the Egyptian. Like, well, honestly, since it came up, man, like I'll say this too. I think you may agree on this, but I, as a kid, I will totally admit that the second movie was by far my favorite. Like, oh yeah, I was of a absolutely. Certain age. But like as I grew older, I much uh, more. I always loved the first movie, but I, I came to appreciate it more and more as it went along. And like I still, anytime I watch the movies, I usually watch them all. The third one is honestly hard to watch. Like it's it's got some like fun nostalgic moments and like one of the greatest bad edits in like movie history. Whenever like the bad guy falls off the cliff, there's just a point where like literally you can like see they just like photoshopped him away as he was falling. Like it's really bad. Um, after Die Hard, I mean, come on, people, it can be done. Yeah, uh, obviously, I think we were both into the other cartoon show that came out in the eighties. Did you ever get into any of the other Turtles cartoons? There was one that was on, I think, either in the late nineties or early two thousands on on Saturday, where like they started traveling to space eventually, and uh, it was, I think, it was the ser- one or two series before the Nickelodeon one, and I've only seen like, but, but like that one was really, really good. Yeah, I've only was. seen like a couple of the Nickelodeon ones. So, uh, the one you're talking about, I think, is the one that came out in 2002, and it was on Fox Kids. Like, that was back yeah. when it was still, uh, there was still Saturday morning cartoons, which is yeah. a thing of the past now, I know. But, uh, that was a good iteration. Admittedly, I didn't get very far into that one, just because of the nature of the beast of, like, how you had to watch it at that time. I think I, we were both getting to an age that probably, uh, a lot of times we were probably, you know, moving on, playing video games, doing other stuff I'm outside. Catch it. Right format when it was playing like and i think it was like just on a random sunday afternoon or something i felt like it came on like after school but it was like one of those shows that i would always see like the tail end of it like before the simpsons <laughs> came on like but you never actually see the whole episode which is just frustrating <laughs> I don't where they didn't have eyes too I don't uh, remember. But you mentioned the 2012 series, man, and I will say i've watched a lot of that series i uh, i really enjoy yeah. it uh, quite a yeah. bit and Admittedly, I think the the 2012 series is the best of the cartoon shows that came out. Like as much as I love the 1980s version and the nostalgia vibe will always be there, the 2012 <laughs> version is like a really solid show. Like they bring a lot of depth to the characters. I know you've tried to get me to watch it for a very long time, but I just have only I've, I'm one of those people that I always push back when everyone tells you that you have to absolutely watch something. It turns me off for a little while, but I always get around to it eventually. But I know you have a very deep love for the 2012 one. I think that if I had to like rank my all time favorite turtle stuff in general, like I would rank uh, this 1990 movie that we're talking about today as number one. I really I I think it's the perfect blend of um like getting the turtles like attitudes and characteristics and like independent like you know personalities uh with like a good mix of heart and then the 2012 cartoon would probably be my second favorite man getting back to the the movie something i will say like i know you know this and i probably we've probably talked about the podcast before but like i'm always a donatello guy like i love donatello and i love him and mikey and all the movies and they're the way they get along so well. Donatello, like, hands down, the right player choice if you're playing the old arcade game for what it's worth. Oh, absolutely. But I have to say, like, as an adult watching this for the first time in like over 10 years, I have a lot more respect for Raph. And I used to absolutely Hell hate yeah. Raph. But, like, he takes on so many people by himself in this movie. And, like, he doesn't really, he flinches a little bit, but he's like, sarcastic about it and like being an adult who gets angry a lot more often now i felt his anger a lot <laughs> i love I, uh, I love the scene where he's fighting on the rooftop and he's like guys how do you ever expect to beat me and then like 20 <laughs> more guys show up he's like yeah. oh yeah that's a good plan <laughs> i love that part and like that's literally when he's about to get the crap kicked out of him but like i thought good for you raf I, I respect you a lot more in this one but i still don't understand why they didn't try to get him some kind of medical attention Dude, you can't take a fucking mutant turtle to the doctor. Like, it's not... You can go get supplies to treat the mutant turtle. And I couldn't tell what he needed. Did he just have bruised ribs? Like, they never... He was just in a coma for a few days and then woke up. I don't get that part. Probably internal bleeding. I don't... There's gotta be Internal something. bleeding? Internal bleeding. That's exactly right. <laughs> oh, man. But I, I love the, the Donnie and Casey bonding, like, yes. with the trucks. And like I don't remember noticing before blinds. that they were... 
do what? They're like both mechanically inclined, and so they're yeah. like riffing on each. And, and I love when they're like ribbing each other the whole time in too. alphabetical order. Like <laughs> yeah. I don't remember ever catching that before. <laughs> but yeah, I very much got a kick out of that scene. And then something, and like you touched about it earlier too, like the the scene where they're doing all the the meditating. Like I just I, I love that so much more as an adult too. And I, it was a nice touch to have Mikey like tear up when they see Splinter, like. The emotions, always, dude, in yeah. that scene are insane for, like, especially when we're talking puppet. 1990 puppet technology. Like, it's it's incredible. I mean, there, there's a few places, I'll admit, like, you look and you're like, oh, that puppet turtle's making a really weird face right now. But, like, <laughs> 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 but like for the most part, like, they're able to convey so much emotion through, like, six inches of fucking foam rubber. You know what I mean? At some points, the eyes are actually a little bit creepy, and I don't know how I didn't see it as a kid, but there are points where they're looking at the camera, and I'm like, oh! There's actually points, too, where you can, uh, if you, like, pause just right, and I think it's even worse in the second movie, actually, which is weird, but you can actually see the actors' faces through the puppet masks in several places, uh, which is interesting. There's also, in this first film, a really funny scene where they're going through April's apartment, and keep in mind, this is a very low-budget, independent film, but there's one scene, but for, like, about a second... You can actually see a crew member just like on his hands and knees behind April's kitchen table. And it's like, if like out of context, it's the creepiest thing. Like, you just think it's this guy like bourbon on her or whatever. But, uh, uh, it's really funny just to see this crew member just kind of like trying his best to tuck out of the camera. But he's so, like, he's very blatantly in this corner of the screen. Huh. I never knew that before. I might have to look at that. (laughs) It's a fun one, dude. Uh, you mentioned them being creepy, too, man. Have you seen the images going around recently where one of the... I think it's Leonardo's mask has been uh, kind of going around publicly, pictures of it, because uh, the actor, I think, actually had it. And unfortunately, uh, the rubber foam compound that it's made of is actually starting to decompose. So it, what's happening is the skin of the mask is actually kind of stretching in or, like, tightening in, and it's pulling the features away from the robotics. So it looks hella creepy. Is it like a Terminator turtle? Kind like not quite that bad, but like zombie turtle. You know what? Actually, it's like Terminator, but like not when he's full metal. Like when you can kind of first start to see like chinks in his skin. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's like that. It's that's just I still like the way they pulled off this puppetry is just pretty, pretty. It seems like almost a lot more work than it would be nowadays where you just CGI everything. But I like That's sad I mean, though, man. I think like part of the reason that like I I, I enjoyed the 2014 the remake, Michael Bay ones the, the the first one the second one is eh, it's hard it's hard they to never watch. even used their weapons in the second one I know I own it and I have I haven't watched it since I bought it I have like the dope collector's tin like turtles van thing that it came in and I like the way it looks on my shelf but the movie itself is meh. Uh, but the the re- the first remake I actually kind of like. I I think it's okay. It's kind of but the I think the biggest disconnect is like you just can't emotionally connect to the CGI things as much as you can like the physical things that people can actually see and touch. Yeah, it's uh well, and like other things, I like things like frames per second. I've talked to you in length in the past about frames per second in movies, like the the Hobbit movies and how they filmed them at like a faster rate to make the action seem more real. Yeah, but they actually. Like, I read that they actually slowed it down on this because of the puppets. Like, uh, it said that a lot of the dialogue sh- scenes were shot at 23 frames per second. And then when they played at the normal speed at 24 frames per second, frames per second, they appeared to look a little bit sharper. And they actually did the same thing with fight scenes, except they actually shot the fight scenes at 22 frames um, or sometimes 23. So that when they would put it, play it at 24, it would look a little bit faster. So I guess that, like, the action, when you actually saw them filming, it must have been so much slower, like, in real time. So I, I just think it's interesting when they play camera tricks like that on you. Because the action, like we talked about, looks pretty darn good. That is really interesting. And it makes sense that they would have to kind of slow it down so the actors could move, like, more believably as yeah. ninjas in those big bulky costumes. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of interesting to think about how much it took to bring each turtle to life too because inside each turtle you have an, an actual physical actor. Uh then in addition to that you have a puppeteer controlling the facial features and then in addition to that uh every turtle is voiced by a different actor except for Raphael. Raphael's the mm-hmm. only voice actor who does both the physical and voice acting part, but 
that's a lot of people like per turtle just to bring that to life well they also have to have an enemy miles dude and the enemy in this film is fantastic like I love the way they portray Shredder in this. It's very minimalist, less is more type of situation. Uh, but I like his costume. It's it looks imposing, dude. Like I don't want to fight that guy. No, because he's too spiky. He's all yeah. You're gonna every blow you land is gonna hurt more than like it's gonna hurt you more than him by far. And he's the only person Leonardo cut with the sword in the entire movie. Even though I saw him hit. Foot clan members <laughs> with this sword. He never drew blood. He's a trained he ninja. Shredder. He turns it sideways every time because he's not. That's not the ninja way. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, honestly, but, uh, Leonardo's weapons always kind of do, in a way, stand out. Like even Raphael's weapons, you could kind of see as being used to like disarm and like detain more. But yeah. like, what are you going to do with swords other than slice a dude up? Or if you're Raph, throw him at Donatello's crotch. <laughs> but what about the fact uh, I, i've been wanting to bring up the comparison between the turtles and daredevil i mean you got the foot clan which is rumored to be a parody of the hand which is the organization daredevil fights you've got the ooze yeah that apparently is an homage to to the ooze that blinded daredevil like i, I like that tie into it peter laird and kevin eastman the creators have straight up said that when they wrote this comic they had been reading a lot of daredevil at the time and they were just trying to come up with the most insane silly thing and at one point there were rabbits and then it became turtles and uh <laughs> long story short uh that all of that is 100 percent connected to daredevil it's even supposed to be the same crash where Daredevil got his powers, like the turtles yeah. are simultaneously in the sewers below as that's happening. Which Splinter was already the most intelligent rat that would ever exist before that point, because he could straight up yeah. stand up and do martial arts. But honestly, I like this iteration, and that scene is arguably silly. Like it's sub- it's it's objectively silly. I mean, he looks ridiculous as a little rat puppet <laughs> doing martial arts, but like at the same time. I think this is a really cool origin story. I love the way it connects Splinter, like, directly to Shredder. Um, mm-hmm. it, I mean, not that, like, the other ones don't, where it's like he actually mutates in from a man into a, how did, a rat. How but... did he get here from Japan? I don't remember hearing that in the explanation last night. I mean, you gotta assume he just crawled on a ship somewhere. <laughs> but they don't explain it! I think they actually say, he says, like, I, I escaped to somehow. I, I don't know. You, you might be right. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Over thousands of miles of ocean somehow. He's a ninja rat, As was bro. the style at the time. He's got the, he's got the dedication <laughs> if he needs to. He'll walk if he has to. <laughs> okay, the ocean Mons. walkers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I remember, as a kid, always wanting April's drawings. Oh, dude, yeah. Uh... And Those freaking are really, stupid really Danny cool. got it's like, one. Uh, what are they? Colored pencils? Crayons? Well, he, yeah, I guess so. But if Danny got one, everybody should get one. Damn it. Danny's an interesting character because he's really not that redeemable. Like, in some ways, you kind of feel like towards the end, he's redeemed himself a little bit. I mean, he does give that $20 back, of course. But, uh, <laughs> But like, all but he the does way... it in such a cocky way. Like, <laughs> trust me, I owe you trust this. Me, I owe trust you this. Me. Yeah, just <laughs> yeah, like what? Huh? Um, like I, I get like he tries to go back to like see Splinter or whatnot, but ultimately he leads them right to I, I, like he he ultimately twice. like screws twice them he over leads twice. them right to yeah him. yeah. And I just remember as a kid rewatching the movie at the beginning, being like, oh, "There's Danny, he's bad!" Like the whole time in the opening scene where they're all stealing stuff. I do like the uh, the scene there at the end, too, with Danny, where it's actually Casey Jones, like, uh, comes to kind of save the day and help rescue Splinter and whatnot. But there's always this one really funny, like, scene, and I think it's sweet in a roundabout way, but, like, basically Splinter is, like, very understandably, who are you? And Casey Jones, like, he does, like, this motion towards Danny to get him to help, and he, like, lifts the chain, he puts Splinter up under his shoulder, and then he gives him, like, this long eye gaze for a moment, and he's like, a friend. And it's like, cool, I think that's very sweet, but, like, wouldn't it the logical thing to do there be like, hi, I'm a friend, and then do all that shit, then you can be like, call me Casey. I don't know. It was See, a that weird part- moment. That part's not the weird moment to me. The weird moment is after he fights the other guy and then he picks Splinter back up and Splinter goes, Casey. And that's all he says. 
<laughs> it's like the batteries on Splinter's puppet head ran out in that moment. <laughs> Crazy. Well, it sounds like he enjoyed it a little too much is how it sounds. <laughs> but let's talk about Casey a little bit because he's a murderer or attempted murderer because <laughs> he tries to trash compact Shredder at the end and it's just a... Uh... Whoops. I do, he doesn't <laughs> try, sir. He straight up does trash. I know he tries because he doesn't do a good enough job. So, well, like, that doesn't mean hurts. he didn't do it. I mean, we yeah. we for the conclusion of this film, it is seemingly that Shredder is dead, and of course yep. that won't last because Kevin Nash has to come back and portray that role next uh, movie. <laughs> but yeah, it's a bow, it's a little, bow, bow. little brutal. There. As a kid, you're like, oh, <laughs> funny. As an adult, you're like, what the hell, Casey? I don't know, man. He had it coming. Like, I don't blame Casey in that moment. Like, he tried to kill all my cool turtle ninja friends, and, like, you're kind Did of Did they douche. really kill a single person in the movie? Did the Foot Clan kill anybody? Ooh. We're at a moral conundrum here, aren't we? They killed so, the economy, Richie, and that's clearly the most important thing in this world. <laughs> Did they kill the economy, or were they hoarding items before the coronavirus stu- struck? 30 because, years. They just, yeah. they just knew, yeah. Well, to be fair, I'm sure everyone's seen the memes, but Michelangelo practicing social distancing before it was cool with the, the pizza scene. Oh, I haven't even I haven't seen this meme. I need to be I, I need <laughs> this meme to come my direction. Yeah, there's memes where they joke about social distancing with the scene where he's paying for the pizza through the sewer. Oh, nice. That's fun. Uh, Which, actually, speaking of that scene, it's Michael, uh, isn't it? Yeah, actually, all four of the actors that play inside the suits of the turtles actually make cameo appearances in the movie. And that pizza delivery uh, kid was actually uh, the actor that plays Michelangelo. See, his name is um, Michelin Sisti. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, but there's also uh, Josh Pays, or Pies, who is Raphael. He was the uh, passenger in the back of the taxi cab when Raphael and... Uh, Casey Jones fight and they run across the car. Uh, the guy's like, "Was that a big giant turtle?" And the taxi cab's like, "Yep." Where do you want to go? <laughs> like it's like a normal Which makes day. that even better. Normal day in uh, old New York. Uh, Leaf Tilden, who plays Donatello, is actually the foot messenger that meets April in the subway station that slaps her in the face. And then David Foreman, who is Leonardo, plays a gang member in the warehouse during Casey's fight with Tatsu. Nice. Man, yeah, honestly, it seems so like uh, David Foreman and Leaf Tilden kind of got the short end of the stick on that because, like, they're just kind of in crowds and Leaf is wearing a mask the entire time. Yeah, that's. I mean, but to be fair, they're the turtles, so at least they'll always have that, even though their voices won't ever be heard unless they're Raph. Interesting. Yeah. I, I love that. We get Raph stuck with Corey Feldman, a, uh, but I love Put that. on a trench coat and hat and just walk around, no problem. Yeah, everything's going to the movies. totally good. <laughs> but then in the next day, he's following April, and he's in broad daylight, and it's like, no one's good. Well, it's New York. It's normal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we talked, actually, uh, the funny thing about that is there's very clearly uh, New... It's very clearly New York from, like, the outside shots and the exterior shots, and they shot a few key scenes where they needed landmarks there. Uh, this is one of those movies where the very opening shot uh, features the World Trade Center, which is always weird if you're watching a movie and you see that, I guess. I, I don't know. Maybe it's not for everybody, but like it's just one of those key movies where it's literally like the very first thing you see. Which I, I honestly see. didn't even pay attention. Like I saw the New York City landscape, but I didn't even think about that. Oh, I'm right just on. so used to the movie. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Uh, I don't think it means one way or anything regardless, but... I just thought it was interesting to point out. But regardless, this movie was actually mostly shot in North Carolina, Castle Hayne, North Carolina. Uh, that is also the set that was used for Dino Hatton in the Super Mario Brothers movies three years Ooh. later. Yeah. Oh, and apparently also the Top Dollars nightclub from The Crow. So they've used that uh, this abandoned cement factory for quite a while. Hmm. There's a lot of uh, interesting stuff going on here, Miles. A lot. <laughs> well, do you have any other just uh, memories or fun facts or anything at all that you want to personally say about this movie? Or honestly, we can open it up. Anything about the franchise in general uh, that you that you want to talk about before we, we wrap this one up? Oh, man. They're, like, the franchise in total, is just even keeping within the realm of the movies, there's just, like, so many memories. I, I mean used to go to sleepovers at my friend's house as a kid and we would put the soundtrack on for the second movie and pretend we were fighting like 
Toka and Re- and Rezar, but then we would also throw it off to like the the end scene in the first movie where all of a sudden we'd be up on a rooftop fighting Shredder, getting our asses kicked. Nice. Like I remember reenacting that stuff. We would all used the time. to stay up watching both movies and reenact all of them. But like one of the memories that stands out to me the most is when the third movie came out, and I, I wish I, I if only there was some kind of application online that you can look up the release date of a movie and some, i'm trying to some install web-based the time. database perhaps yeah and, but i'm trying to remember because when the third movie came out sorry if you can hear me typing i'm trying to type it up real quick i don't remember if it came out in the summer or if it came out during like the school year but what i remember is my father taking off work to take me to go see the movie. And I feel like the way my memory plays in my mind is that he actually took me out of school to go see it. And I'm pulling it up right now. It came out in March 1993, so that would have been while school was still going on. But he took me out of school early, and he took off work to go take me at like noon to go watch the third movie because he knew this was a big deal and we had to go see it. And I granted, it's the one that people hate the most, but I remember absolutely loving it at the time because, I mean, we were kids. And Turtles in Japan, who doesn't love that? Uh, I saw it in theater and loved it to death as a kid. It's just that's the one. Mine doesn't even have a head. (laughs) When you go back and uh, and watch it now, it's just it's very much like one of these things is not like the other one type of thing. (laughs) But no, I just I remember that whole experience being fantastic. And then we went to Albertsons and he bought me the Donatello dressed in the like samurai outfit from the movie, which I love. So that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I just like. These movies, even though I haven't watched them in a while, definitely hold a, a special place like in my upbringing and everything that was me as a child. So, yeah, they, they, uh, they're they fun, man. Like it's they even the first one being darker, they all have a very campy feel to them. But like campy, I mean, in a in a good way. For sure. Yeah. Um, I think that the third one like is campy is almost the perfect word for it. Honestly, like <laughs> that just, that fits to a T and, but like, even you're right. Like even the first two have some camp to them for, for sure. Like no, no doubt on that. Isn't the second one, like really, really short too. I always remember the second one being super short. Now I want to know that as well. I feel like it's not that much shorter than the, the, I think it's probably right at an hour and a half, maybe slightly shorter than the first one. Okay. Yeah, I just for some reason I remember watching it the last time being like, "Oh, it's over already." Didn't we see the TMNT, the animated one that came out in between? We watched it at midnight when yeah, it came I, out. I, I thought we went to like an early release showing of it. Yeah, for sure. That was uh, that was also not too bad. I know that's like kind of its own independent property because it's like this weird animated movie that doesn't exist in any of the other like worlds. It's not but, acknowledged. <laughs> yeah, but still, it's pretty cool. I remember my issue with that one is I feel like they overplayed the Leo Raff thing. Like, well, that's just because that's the most common story that you always see. It's yeah. always, it always comes down to Leo and Raff, yeah. And it's just uh, us being Donatello guys. I just well, I I'm, like a, when, I'm a Michelangelo dude, but I'm I, also I, a Raphael guy. When we uh, well, I mean, our boys are Donnie and Mikey, and they have a lot of good scenes together in these early movies. So I wish they'd have yeah. a little bit more further development in the later ones. Yeah, the TMT, TMNT did treat Donatello and, uh, and Michelangelo like way more of an afterthought than even these movies did. Like they didn't really yeah. have any of those fun scenes. Or, it's been a while since I've seen that one, to be honest. So I might have to check that one out soon. But one of my favorite things about all the characters is that they can all be the other ones, basically. Like Raph's not always the angry guy. He has a lot of moments, even in the first movie, where he's sarcastic and funny. And like Leo has moments up on the rooftop when Shredder's taunting them where he's the angry one. And I and I like it that they like are their characters, but they have like their brothers. They have little nuances of each other as well. Yeah, like just because like Raphael is cool but rude doesn't mean that he doesn't know anything about machines. He probably does some machines. It's only natural that they would learn a little bit, you jerk. <laughs> right? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Like, they feel like a family in this movie, maybe more than mm. in any of the others. Like, and that's, I think, really, really cool. Uh, actually, uh, another movie coming out soon that I, I think is neat. Uh, uh, this is just, like, from, like, a random, like, clip at one of those, like, red carpet in- interviews. But a movie that we both liked uh, came out a couple years ago, A Quiet Place, a uh, horror film where... Uh, basically, you can't make noise or you die is how it kind of works. Well, uh, the 
director of, or I'm sorry, the, not the director, the writers, because it was John Krasinski's the director of that one, I believe. But uh, the uh, writers of that film actually said in an interview that after uh, they do A Quiet Place 2, they're wanting to do another live action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles um, movie. And when somebody asked him, like, wow, it's like such a huge disconnect from A Quiet Place. And they're like, well, not really. If you think about it, A Quiet Place is about a family that is being challenged by a like un uh, like unbeatable evil and they have to come together as a unit to survive so like it mm. actually really fits the turtle narrative quite a lot and i was like these guys get it let them make a movie <laughs> well you know we've been we've been praising the movie for the most part, I do want to bring up two interesting. It's a ten, Richie. Shut the fuck up. Two interesting <laughs> continuity issues. Besides them not treating Raph. Um, so the Foot Clan cuts the power to April's apartment, yet her answering machine still works. Ah, nice. It was on battery mode. Get over yourself. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll give you that one. But as as put on IMDb near the beginning of the film, Michelangelo orders a pizza with extra cheese, pepperoni, ham, and a lot of other stuff. However, the pizza received contains neither pepperoni nor ham. That is a turtle faux pas right there. Well, they didn't pay full price, so I guess maybe like the guy like picked off some ingredients. <laughs> no, that's a good observation. I, I wish I had looked this up now because it, it just popped in my mind when you said this, and now I can't remember where I read it. But I believe there was some real weird thing with the pizza sponsorship on this one because it's actually a Domino's pizza that's delivered in the movie. But I think that Pizza Hut actually got like a commercial tie in with the film, which is really weird that they would have those like different connections essentially. I thought they did the Noid or whatever in the pizza advertisements. Well, that was like, was called- the Noid was Domino's, like, go-to character. Like, that was like, they even made a video game based on the Noid. Yeah. But, you know, I was, I was being difficult with it. I will say I enjoyed the scene where Donatello jumped over the Foot Clan, swiping Adam while he was on the skateboard. That was some high-level skateboarding skill right there. Dope stuff right there, for sure. And, uh, man, what's the what's the line? It's like a wise man... Uh, wise man said like wisdom is divine no something knowledge is divine but a wise man never pays full price for uh late pizza pizza yeah such a classic classic line <laughs> like mm. and uh probably the reason i like would i remember back in the day like especially like college age when they still had like the, those like if your pizza's not here in 30 minutes like you get it for free which just like doesn't exist anymore but uh, back in the day, I'd be like on the patio, like twenty eight minutes, yeah, twenty nine minutes, go. And they don't. You know that. what was funny with me is that what I used to do with my father all the time is the scene in the first movie, and like I completely forgot this till you said it. When Donatello, when there's like, well, Raspin gone a really long time. He should be here any minute now. And then it comes crashing through the roof. There was one time I, my dad was like, the pizza's taking a while, and I go, it should be here any minute now. And as soon as I said that, the pizza guy knocked on the door. So I started doing that Ooh. every time a pizza was ordered. And I never I never made it work like that again. But like you saying that reminded me about doing stuff like this. And yeah, you don't really get to do things like that anymore. I mean, I guess I could still try that, but who's got time for that game? Yeah, that's interesting. You should, uh, I don't know, yeah, if it makes can... it happen faster. I, that kind of ties into like, <laughs> If only I'd ordered this pizza X amount of time ago. <laughs> I just went on like the timing. I did a really good job of timing it out that one time. That's awesome. Totally right. tubular, dude. Cowabunga! <laughs> I, I made, made a, a funny. funny. <laughs> I love Splinter, man. Such a good movie. <laughs> man, uh, you know what? Thank you, Richie, for agreeing to do this silly movie review or chat about the turtles. Just a geek out, really. I uh, I had a really fun time rewatching the movie yesterday, and just uh, this movie legitimately has always just been a part of my life. And I, I even in like the age of Marvel, where we've had some incredible comic book movies, this to me is hands down my favorite comic book movie, uh, and one that I can go back and watch over and over and over again, and always get so much out of. Uh, for those listening, hope you enjoyed us rambling about the Ninja Turtles and not the Simpsons, but I assure you, we will be back again next week. I assure you, because we already have it recorded. It just, uh, is getting (laughs) bumped because of my neurosis, but we, uh, we'll be back again. What's our next episode that's coming out, Rich? You have any idea? I didn't think the next one was recorded yet. I thought it was the Dumbbell Indemnity. 
No, the next one to come. That's the next one that we have to record. But the, oh. the next one that, that's recorded. <laughs> I'm breaking continuity. Definitely already happened. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one's the 17th episode. Hold up, hold up. If only we had notes it's, to tell it's us. It's not these the things. 17th episode. It's like which the... one? <laughs> which one is this going? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. You uh, know what? I'm just. I'm gonna bring us back home here. I got us. Perfect. I just want to tell you something, Miles, and listeners. I'm proud of you, my sons. Tonight you have learned the final and greatest truth of the ninja. That ultimate mastering comes not from the body, but from the mind. Together, there is nothing your great many minds cannot accomplish. Help each other. Draw upon one another. And always remember the power that binds us. The same as what brought me here today, in which I gladly return with my final words. Listen to our show next week, my listeners. And until next time, turtle power.